Okay, two things God wants me to share. This is prophetically. It's going to come by the Spirit. And the first one is, and, it, and I just want to kind of lay it out to you, is I want to explain something. And I think we all need to learn this. Do you know the difference between guidance and control? It needs to be addressed, so I'm going to address it. Contro control and guidance, they're not the same. They seem similar. Okay. How many here know that you have a, a domicile you dwell in, a place where you stay, and you want to be in a certain amount of control and not let things get out of hand? Say amen. So there's a certain amount of control is okay. You know, you control your kids when they're over the neighbor's house. They don't destroy the house. You know what I mean? Those things are okay. But when you're dealing with people and adults, we need to make the difference between control and guidance. The Bible says we are guided by the Spirit, not controlled by the Spirit. Say amen. amen. The Bible says that we're guided by God through our own willingness so that God does not force. Satan is the one that drives us and forces us. He's the one that tries to get us into a bondage or in some situation where he can have some form of control. All right, so let me go back to me, okay? I'm the pastor of the church, okay? Now, I really don't appreciate that, the position of pastor, because I don't like names and positions. I like just to be called a servant, but because God shows me to be who I am, then all of the weight of this building and the property and everything falls upon my wife and I, doesn't it? So we have to be in a certain amount of control. Hello? We just don't let the homeless come in and camp on the background and move in and do all that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There's no guidance in that. But let me go down as a pastor. Pastor Kerry's never going to try to control your life. That's you and God's responsibility. But our, there are times I'm going to guide you and give you better direction. That is what I'm supposed to do. It says God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And in the work of the ministry, you got to know what to do, how to do it, who's going to do it, why it's going to be done, and when it's going to be finished. With that, there's a certain amount of guidance and control. So if I ever say to you, you, you did this wrong, I'm not trying to control you. This is God's house. I want God's house to shine. You have a house. This is God's living room. So the best is here. You. Okay. And the excellence is here. How we do things. So when pastor says, hey, I'd like you to do it this way. It's not because I want to make and control everything. Okay, it's because I want to see it done the way God wants it done. So never say, pastor wants it done this way. <laughs> say, God wants it done this way. Can you say amen? All right, so control is when you can't do anything. The person is controlling you. So you have to ask them for permission to go to the bathroom. You have to ask them permission to do this, to do that. That's control. Hello, everyone got it? But there's guidance involved in everything. You guide your children, hopefully. Amen? <laughs> they don't guide you. The tail does not wag the dog. All right. So if you ever see that if I'm guiding, I'm a businessman too, and if I'm guiding things, it's because I want the whole of us to be blessed and maybe something needs to change. And that's okay. That is not control. That's not me wanting to be in charge of your life. I couldn't handle that responsibility. That's your job. But if you are in the house of God creating a problem, I am going to guide you. Amen. Not spank you. <laughs> Say, I got a pastor. So control and guidance are completely different. I'm a guider. I'm a teacher. But I will not control your life. God gives me the right, though, stepping in once in a while and say, hey, I, you think you need to check this base. And I did that with you today, didn't I, says. Help, didn't it? That's what I'm called to do. That's why you pray for me. All right, the second thing God supernaturally wants me to share with you, and this is a harder one because we came through some weird times, didn't we, as, as a nation and as people, even in our own areas. 
strange times, weird paranoias and fears, and you know, all this scuttlebutt that's going around and all that kind of thing. Well, one of the things I want to encourage you, now please don't get mad at me, okay, is really watch your testimony and any compromise in your life. Do not, Satan will try to set us up to compromise and then have your brothers and sisters see you. I used to say this a long time ago. If you're going to sin, do it by yourself somewhere else. If you're going to sin, God forbid, can you say amen? But don't be acting up and doing crazy things in front of others. Now you have to explain. And do you know the difference between sin and trespass? Do you know there's a difference? Sin is just making mistakes before God. And remember, our sin is covered because we belong to God. Say amen. But when our sin stumbles someone else, this is what I'm talking about. Let's not compromise in our life and do something where I cause you to stumble. You wouldn't appreciate if I did something and it caused you all to stumble because I would eventually be sorry. But now I've caused you to stumble. That's a trespass. You see, I can sin off by myself and it's still wrong, okay? But I'm a child of God, you know? And maybe some of you need a release or one, so I have no idea. But to sin openly is condemned because it affects people's walks. So in your walk, say, God, help me not to compromise. Help root out of me the things that I say yes to that maybe I shouldn't. And when I'm around certain people, they need to see a testimonial godly woman or a man. They don't need to see somebody acting like everybody else. And then, of course, and remember, this is just wisdom came from me in my prayer life for you. I'm not saying you're compromising. I'm not saying you're doing this. But I'm saying just so the lies of the enemy, we can pulverize them. Remember, one other time, I think it was two weeks ago I shared that how... If you've noticed, I do have to consult places like YouTube and Rumble and things like that for articles and things that deal with our Christianity, okay? But I noticed there's a lot of accusation out there. People writing about ministries and condemning other ministries. Don't get, remember I told you two weeks ago, don't get involved in any of that. Somebody says, oh, so-and-so ministry, they had a problem. Tell me one that doesn't. Doof. That means doofus for short. We don't get involved in other people's situations. We leave it alone. Who do we belong to, folks? How much God would get, I would be in trouble with God if I meddled in your personal life. My job is not to kick over your garbage can and see what you're doing. <laughs> Hello, there are ministers that will do that. I had one. He, he, he sneak up on you, you know. Hey, I'm here. What are you hiding? <laughs> My goodness. So the idea is, listen, God, it's not what goes into a, a man that defiles him. Okay. It's what we, what comes out of us. Okay. How we act, how we interact. Okay. Another thing is happy is the individual that does not condemn himself and that which he allows. You guys remember any of those scriptures? I bet you you don't. The Bible says that if you need to sit down and watch a soap opera, just a half an hour of a soap opera, God forbid, and that causes you to relax, happy is the man that doesn't condemn himself and that which he allows. But let's say you are a meat lover. And you're going to visit your best friend who is a vegetarian. Please don't show up at his door with a steak in your mouth. So the difference is, when you go out and you have fun, don't let the devil set you up and compromise you. Two, when you are in the area of flowing and you have, maybe you have children and different things where you have to put some guidance on there. Guiding and don't control. When you meet people. And you haven't seen it for a while, don't say, what have you been doing? No, greet them, love them. People need to be loved and accepted 
and cared for. And that's what God does for us. Amen. Did you learn anything by the preamble here? <laughs> All right. We're going to be studying. We're studying new creation realities. If you're writing down notes, this one's called Listen to Me and Dwell Safely. God's speaking. He says, listen to me and dwell safely. Now, how many here want the best for your children? So you would tell them certain things so they could avoid it. I did that with my children. I sat down with them, finally says, I want to tell you, this is not a lecture. I want to tell you some things that I did when I was younger. That I don't want you to do because it's just heartache. And there's those times that you share. Do you believe God wants to do those things with us, share with us things that will help our life? He's purposed and he's planned for us to be before him in love, to be wonderful creatures of Christ. Amen. And the enemy stole all that. And now he wants to work with us to restore all that and more. Look at your neighbor and say, did you know you're a different species of being than Adam is? Say it. Did you know Adam was created perfect? But we have one thing that Adam didn't have. Can you tell me what that one thing is? We have God in us. Adam didn't have God in him. He had God with him. Walked with him. He was perfect, yes. Until, the, you know, until he got tricked. Folks, one of the things that Jesus tells us on this last day is there's a lot of deception out there. That's why I went to God and said, Lord, you want me to start this work? How do you want me to start? He says, don't have a membership. People do not have to sign something or get involved in something. Don't put people under obligation. Don't advertise. It's got to be word of mouth. So the people who are actually advertising for you and you're not bragging about yourself. I mean, he laid out a whole bunch of things for me. And that's what you're experiencing. And it's a wonderful thing that we do it God's way. Can you say amen? So greetings to you this wonderful God-filled morning. Who's Lord? Jesus is Lord. So I hope you've spent some time before you got here, maybe in your car or, or with the Lord, to get yourself into a position of receiving good ground, good seed on good ground. Someone say amen. amen. We know that these are the last days. Perilous times are upon us. So God directed us to focus hard on Christ. Remember? Taking our eyes off the world system, taking our eyes off of people and their advice to us, and especially taking our eyes off of ourselves. Instead, we are, as the body of Christ, to be prepared for what's coming. Do you know what's coming? Two things are coming. Tremendous oppression and bad and tremendous revival and good. Let's go to the Coke glass. You got a Coke glass that's half full or half empty. Satan has had the church looking at what's wrong and getting all caught up in it. Now, listen, I mean, I love this country and I don't want things going wrong. I love my family. I don't want things going wrong. I love my church. I don't want things going wrong, right? It's just a normal thing. But he's got the, the church looking at the problems of other people and other Christians. And God warned us to prepare for what's coming. And so people that are negative, they're going to think, oh man, there's going to be a lot of this. And it's going to be as the days of Noah and everything. But did you notice? This is, this is what God showed me. He says, in the days of Noah, who got blessed? The believers. Who got cursed? Unbelievers. Days of Lot. Who got blessed? So what do we do? We look at the negative. We look at all that's coming on in the negative, And we forget the rescue plan. I'm going to say this to you. And you might want to argue a little bit with me. But listen. God has never caused the righteous to suffer with the wicked. Now, righteous people suffer. Righteous people are in the wrong place at the wrong time. They can get sick and all that. But he is, God is not punishing righteous people with the wicked he always removes the righteous can you say amen and and separates the two you start leaning towards god and god will separate you even from your family if they're believing the wrong thing to so he can save us so he can rescue us but we got to work with them the scripture that says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling is saying you and god work it out 
Now, folks, how many's ever worked with bread dough? And bread dough can have some air in it. When you're kneading it, you're bringing the air in there, you're fluffing it all up, right? That's what God's doing with us. He's kneading us and he's causing us to rise and become well. But we have to interact with God daily. Otherwise, our flesh has a tendency to throw you the negatives. God forbid. <laughs> All right. So we take our eyes especially. So eyes off of the world system, eyes off of people and their advice, even though it could be good advice, but it's got to be green with the Bible. And then taking our eyes off of ourselves. Folks, there's a lot of reeling and shaking going on. But it says we have not received a kingdom that is shaking. We received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The key is, are we walking in the cannot be shaken part? Or are we just tasting of it periodically? Hello, when I first was saved, I only tasted that the Lord was good. It took me a time to hang out with him before I really start to take on that goodness. Hello? Amen. How much? Well, I don't know. Some of you know, know my parents. Both of my mom and dad, my sister has gone on to be with the Lord. And I had a good dad. I had one of those dads who involved in the football that I was involved in, involved in baseball when I was involved. When I played in the band, he was there to support. Even mom and dad would come up when I would entertain at bars and, and restaurants playing rock and roll music. They'd come up and, and, and they'd support me. I had a wonderful wonderful parents that way and my dad was really really a wonderful man but there was a fear of dad that I had that took me a while to overcome and he was a good man but he would always say son get me the belt and that was it <laughs> there was a little phrases like you know you know do you hear me as a dad everybody's hearing you now but at the same time my dad was a wonderful man, but I never got to know his wonderfulness until I took the time to be with him. Once I took the time to spend time as we got older and I settled down a little bit and I got to know my dad, I found out I befriended my dad. I, I found out my dad was really cool. And that's great. And this is what I want to tell you. When, the, when you're coming to get to know the Lord, don't stop just the fact that you've got Jesus in your heart. No, get to know your dad. Get to know your father. Take the time to spend him how you know his nature. What God approves of and what God does not approve of. So people don't have to tell you. I, I went to my son one time and I said, son, why am I always having to tell you to do this? And he says, yeah, I was wondering that too, dad. I says, here's the key. If you just listen to my instructions and you do your best to do that, you wouldn't have me lecturing you. If we would just get with God, we'll find out what he desires and wants. It says that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Then he works out any of our flaws or our shortcomings. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. So we should know for sure that meeting with God comes first. Hearing and doing the word creates an unshakable and unmovable foundation under our feet. We are no longer sinners, but children of God, children of his light. We have a better standard, a better way of walking, but we must learn how to. Can you say amen? So we're going to call that listen to me and dwell safely. All of our problems does not, none of them come from God. They come from two sources, the enemy and our flesh from making wrong choices. All your problems that you have other than the mind in, in your flesh is all a product of the fallen nature. Our mind has been exposed to different things all through our life. Amen. Do you remember, how many remember that little cartoon where the guy was trying to decide to do either right or wrong and you see one angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other and they're whispering that's exactly basically when you're growing up that's exactly the influences that were in your life and some of your friends were influencing you wrongly and some of them were influencing you rightly all of they didn't know most people don't know what's going around these thoughts that flow into their head 
But as we begin to walk with God, he shows us how to filter them and cleanse them out. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. I'm going to read rather quickly. First of all, when God meets and talks to us, he does it by revelation. He reveals it to us. How many years God a revealing from God? God showed you something and it came almost supernatural. How many know that that's a very important thing? Now, you can learn things from all kinds of things. You learn from circumstances, other people. You can learn from me and all this. But when God reveals something to you, it's called a revelation or he a revealing. Very important. Now, that revealing you need to know is how God bypasses Satan from picking up what God is saying. So if he says to BJ I, and shows her this and she acts on it, Satan won't even pick up on it. Because it came by supernatural revelation. Now, does the devil hang out with God? No, God threw him out. Does the devil go up and, and hang out of the throne room when we come in to pray? No, he can't even go in there. So when God supernaturally, you're reading in your word, Dave, and all of a sudden something jumps off the page and starts talking to you, Satan doesn't even pick that up. And it goes, whoa, and suddenly you know, and you know where things are happening. That's how God, number one, wants to minister to us. So let's see what he says. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. And I, brethren, this is talking about Paul. When I came to you, I did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and much fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not within persuasive words of human wisdom. Look at this. He said, I can come to you because I have a great education of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, and of power. In verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. My pastor taught me a long time ago, way before there were cars. No, my pastor taught me a long time ago. He says, when you go to a meeting, your spirit is in tune. If you're saved and you go to a meeting, your spirit is in tune. Whoever's speaking, your spirit should pick up that God is being spoken by bearing witness. Some of the words I will say to you, you'll get a witness in you. That's a good thing. Look for that. Because there's a lot of people that preach a lot of college. They preach, now listen to this next one, a lot of psychology. If you do this and be good, and you forgive your neighbor, and then you do this, you'll get that. That's psychology. And it's borrowed from the scripture. Psychology works here. It doesn't work here. That's why you can go to all kinds of counseling and never get a thing. Write down all as many notes you want. You get it in your go the core of your being. Your new man, your spirit man. Everyone say spirit man. Okay, that's the real you. Okay, it's the core of you. Okay, and you have other little things like your body and your mind. But the core of you is your spirit and God working together in your gut or your core. Are you with me? And he says, look, I was with you and all, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the demonstration and the power of God. Can you say amen? In fact, I'd rather have you leave and go somewhere where the power of God's resident than hang around me if all I'm doing is giving you news and psychology. You wouldn't see any power. You wouldn't see people get healed. Hello. The word of God produces after God. Can you say amen? And it has power in it when spoken from our spirit in faith. All right. Let's go down to verse 9. Now listen. But as it is written, this is a quote from the Old Testament. Remember I told you in the Old Testament, they didn't have revelation knowledge. Only the prophet, the priest, and the kings. If you wanted to get saved, you have to find somebody that sacrificed for you and, and go to a priest or something like that. In fact, I even told you that in the Old Testament that people didn't know how to pray. John had to teach his disciples. He was in the Old Testament. And when the disciples of Jesus came, what did they say? Jesus teaches how to pray. Like John taught his disciples. 
Christians, the devil doesn't want you to learn how to pray. He wants you to think you know it. Well, isn't prayer just come conversing with God? I would like to say it is, but it's a whole lot more than that. Okay, a whole lot more than that. Okay? It's like being baptized. Isn't that me just getting wet and dedicating my life? to? It's a whole lot more than that. And the, because the enemy hides things in the nature of the, the fullness and the completeness of God in the truths that we hear. All right. So as it is written, I had not seen nor ear had heard. This is a quote from the Old Testament. Nor have it entered into the heart of man. The heart is deceitful above and desperately wicked. It's the Old Testament quote. Now who lives in your heart? Is he desperately wicked? So don't quote that. That's an excuse. Your heart's not desperately wicked. It's your head and your flesh that need some help. Smile at somebody. Amen. But God has revealed them to us by his what? See the capital S? God wants to reveal things to you so Satan doesn't pick up on it. So you go to God, you meet with God, you condition yourself so you can hear from God, and God begins to take the scripture that you're reading and give you his understanding of it. Nothing more beautiful than that. Are you with me? And he goes, I had not seen, but God has revealed it to them, that's us, by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of God. Now listen to this next phrase. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit, little s, of man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the spirit of God, big s, Holy Spirit. What happened when you got born again? The Holy Spirit came in with God, and your spirit removed Satan's nature out of your spirit and put himself in there, and he calls you his new creature, his children of light. Now, and then what do we do? Bless our darling little pea picking heart. We walk around still in the flesh, trying to live like we think we should live. And all this time, we've got this huge, wonderful package that we're not tasting of. That's where preachers come in. That's where teachers, how can they know if nobody shares, nobody teaches? Hello. And that, you look at the churches nowadays, you're not getting the word there, you're getting programs. And they cost lots of money. So guessing who's getting built for the bill? Come on. A lot of this religious stuff, I'm not against anybody, is the enemy puts us into a religious thing instead of a personal walk. Remember, it's a personal walk with God. And you know him personally. I'd rather get to know you because you know God personally than you just go to church. Hey, I walk into my garage, do I become a car? You go to church and not be saved. Folks, hello. Walk into a hamburger joint, do I become a burger? Depends how many times you show up. All right, moving right along. Okay, so look at this. Verse 11 again. Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. That's why we spend time with them. So God can show you your future. God has your future in his hands. He wants more than anything to share it with you, to reveal it with you, so you could have confidence in your stepping through life. But without seeking him, without opening up to him, then you're going to guess what tomorrow's going to bring like that one song. We don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. I do. God. And it's up to me how much I want to be with him. And that being with him is going to saturate me. And look out for darkness. They better run like mad because I'm filled with God. I'm filled with light. I'm filled with almighty presence. That's you. Man, the darkness has no candle against a candle. I mean, you just flip on a match and darkness runs. Shows you how dark the church has been for such a long time. No compromise, folks. It is not right for you to go out and hang in the bar. And then what if one of your brothers and sisters sees you and they stumble? It is not right. You know, if you're going to go do that, go to Olympia. 
That's where all the screwballs hang out. <laughs> I know I used to deliver. That was my route. We'd go down there, and there people would be all kinds of weird stuff. Weird. One time, I was trying to wave some people across the parking lot. You're going to laugh at this. And, I wave in the, and I'm, in a, I'm in a company van, you know. And I'm waving these people across the parking lot because they're just merrying around. Nobody down there. I think all the people down there got their brains bleached or something. I have no idea. And I, was, I finally was moving my hand. You don't really do that at your parking spot. I moved my hand like that. And this girl got out of the line, went over and jumped in my van. Says, you want a good time? I'm never moving my hands again. <laughs> never. I says, no, I don't, and I'm working. Get out of my van. Oh, gosh. That didn't happen once. Happened two or three times. All in Olympia. <laughs> moo, 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 moo. Reminds me of New York when I showed up. Anyway, let's go on past it. All right, here's what we're going to cover, and we'll cover it rather quickly. I hope you, I, I blessed you a little bit, but some things you can identify with. We're going to cover these four areas, but to show you how God wants to be personal with you and reveal his will and his plans to you personally, okay? And when we're in a corporate setting, like for this church, there's a corporate purpose and plan for the church, so you have one for your life, and if somehow you're here at church, so we're all working here together. Amen. You got an oar in your hand. Stop beating Joe over the head with it. We're all going the same way, right? Now, bam, 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 straighten up. All right, let's move on past that. We'll cover these four things. Number one, we go to God securing our future. You go to God every day securing your future. Tomorrow is your future. Secure it. I told Scott, and I don't mind sharing, you know, God's blessed him with some, some things. I says, you need to pray three months out. Don't just pray for today and tomorrow. Pray three months out. Your materials, your business, everything. Pray three months out. Why do we always sandbag when we pray? Flood comes. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Start throwing sandbags of prayer. No, sandbag three months out. Lord, all the way out three months, Lord, I pray over it. Start protecting, giving me favor. Start beginning to order my steps through those months. You're the only one who knows exactly what those months are going to hold. And it's going to be good, God, because you're in it. I say when I get up in the morning, maybe you can borrow this. Lord, I love getting up in the morning, getting up in you and getting up with you. Did you know you get up in God? Unless you're not saved. Huh? And God loves to hear it. Not just because I said it, but these are things he's given me. To acknowledge who you are in God as you start your day. It's very, very good. Say amen. Second of all, walking in the wisdom that we need. You know, these are different times than they were a year ago. Hello? These are different times than they were five years ago. The way you behaved five years ago as a Christian were awful times. There was so much compromise and so much gossip and stuff like that. A lot. And maybe you didn't get involved in it, but it just destroyed the church. Church has been powerless almost, and God is raising up a new standard of believer. It's not anything different than the normal standard, but at least they're believing and not compromising. Hello? Compromise is just like your... How many here have a battery in your car? How many, how many here have a car? <laughs> There's a battery in your car. What's on the battery? What, 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 what poles are on the battery? Antarctica and... <laughs> positive and negative. Now, which part of you or you think is a negative or which part is your positive? Your, your flesh. Which one is that? Yeah. And, and your spirit. Yeah, because you have God in there, Right? Now, can those two poles cross? What would happen if you took a wire and you crossed the positive with the negative? You get a bunch of sparks and then the battery would be dead. And that's what the devil is doing to a lot of Christians. You're talking out of the side of your mouth one thing and then you're another. Now, this is not to make you feel bad. This is to show you how he works. He'll put a thought in your mind next to you know you're speaking and it's totally negative And you catch yourself at it. That's good. But what he does is he tries to cross us with ourselves. What was that tree in the garden? 
the knowledge of the tree of good and good is in your spirit and evil's in your so you are contrary to yourself Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 walk in the spirit so you're not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the lust of the flesh is contrary to the spirit and the spirit to the flesh so if we don't meet with God we'll start to be contrary to everyone and contrary to ourself be walking around doubting yourself have you ever intended to do something your head talked you out of it and then finally, having a spiritual mindset and learning to get rid of that other mindset. And then fourthly, investing our life talents in spirituality. Did you know that we belong to God now? Say amen. amen. And if we do, we should really ask our landlord how to do things. All right. We go to God to secure our future. Go with me to John 16, looking at 13 through 15. Jesus is talking about a new covenant coming. And that day you should not ask me anything. You don't talk to me directly. You talk to the Father in my name. Now, folks, talking inc includes what? Words, doesn't it? So you ask the Father in my name. So it's not thinking, good morning, God. It's saying, good morning, God. Your words are very important. Notice it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. What do you use your tongue for? Speech. Speech. So if death and life and the power of the tongue, maybe that's why some of you just think your prayers. You don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Moving right along. No, everything has to do with declaring the word from your mouth. You don't have to be loud about it. Just speak it. As soon as you speak it, you're declaring your covenant. Angels listen unto the voice of his word. Everyone take your Bible if you have it. Put it up to your ear. Do you hear anything? You have to voice God's word for the angels to get involved. Did you know that? But what do we do? Oh, that's just killing me. I'm dying if I do. I'm dying if I don't. Man, that's just the pits. Boy, that's bad. You know, we start talking that and all the angels are standing around. So would you speak some word? Would you say some things about God? Because we can't do any of that negative stuff. So angels run on our words. Did you know that? I got a whole lesson on angels. So you run on the words we say. Okay? And so does the enemy. He's constantly trying to listen in, isn't he? Hello. Have, did you ever know some people like that? The devil's an eavesdropper, but thank God you are in the spirit and not in the flesh. Amen. So, they go to God to have God reveal our future and then be wise about it and don't tell everybody. Remember Joseph? He went and said, he got a vision from God and told his brothers, you're all going to be bound down to me. Oops. Oops. We don't brag about how God's working in our life. We just simply live it. Some people can look at you and say, my, you're doing good. I've said that to you several times, haven't I? You can see the countenance on you. So can the devil. Amen. So remember, Joseph, sometimes it's good to be silent. <laughs> All right, let's move right along. So. John 16, look at this. However, when he, the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. How much truth? For he will not speak on his own authority. I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you. So. No, he always points you to Christ. Always points you to Christ. If you start hearing people prophesying and telling everybody how great they are and how the Holy Spirit is doing that, you're completely off the wall and it's not of God. Holy Spirit's complete job down here on the earth is to make sure we keep centered on Christ. To make sure we keep centered on Christ. We will stray a little bit and the Holy Spirit will move us over to Christ. Well, I don't want to agree with the Holy Spirit. Then watch what you say. Don't speak evil against another brother or sister. Don't hold resentment. Especially if I ask you to do something, go, he's picking on me. No, I'm not. 
We're working together. Amen. And if your job is emptying the trash, do it good. Or parking or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're doing it for who? All right, let's move on. We're to please him. Please him. Then he said, we'll show you things to come. Now look at this next phrase. He will glorify me. See, the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus Christ because he's talking. For he will take what is of mine and declare. See that word declare unto you? The word declare means to show you in such a way that it's clear and you understand it. God bless, sister. Have fun. Earplugs. <laughs> it's going to a monster jam. I don't know if it's Bigfoot or the Loch Ness. <laughs> Move on. All right, let's go. <laughs> so look at this. He says, so he will declare it unto you, but he doesn't say it once. He says it twice. Listen, verse 16 says, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, Jesus is speaking, that he will take of mine and what? Declare it unto you. Folks, if you never get with God, God can't reveal his future to you. You will stumble on it because you're always moving into the future. Hello? Now you're in the future. Hello? Now you're in the future. Do you want to stumble through the future or do you want to walk with God in it? You meet with God then and that's how he sorts all that out. A couple of points. It's God's will to reveal things to his children. He does it by revelation of the Holy Spirit, revealing it to our hearts, bypassing the devil's ability to hear and understand what's coming. A great big, huge revival is coming, folks. And it's coming like a tsunami. And it's growing right now underneath us and swelling. This is what's happening. But only the believers that meet with God and are sold out with God are going to be able to catch this wave. The rest are going to die early. Folks, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some people who are going to drop off dead because they've been playing games with God so long. They're, they're out of the grace protection. These are the times of the latter days. It's called the glory of the latter house is greater than the glory of the former house, of the first house. That means if you read Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. They fell over dead. We're going to start seeing God move that way. God's not killing them. They're killing their self because it's about Satan's time. Remember, he's going to come on the scene. So there's going to be a split. Righteous are going righteous and it, you know, darkness is going to darkness is going to be a split. And there's going to be one time it'll be a shout and we're going to leave. It's the only time the devil and God agree. God says, come home, kids. And the devil says, yeah, get them out of here. Be a moment in a twinkling of an eye. There won't be one believer in the earth. We'll all be gone. And then shortly after that, there's going to be billions of them falling on their face saying, oh my God, we didn't listen to those Christians when they said God's coming to get them. Hello. Oh, I don't believe in the rapture. Well, hey, what happened to Enoch? What happened to Elijah? What happened to Jesus? All got raptured. Jesus went up church goes up john chapter in revelation chapter four it says that john heard a voice and the voice says come on up you don't see the church anymore in the book of revelation because the rapture happened Amen. you should be shouting it says comfort one another with these words so we have to go to god so he can reveal our future so we don't enter the present tomorrow in fear God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? And God, one of the names for God is God is love. So if you've got fear, you're not spending enough of time with God's love. He'll drive it out of you. He'll drive every bit of fear you have. Maybe you're afraid for your children or something's not working right and the enemy has you all kind of all bound up. No, he'll drive that out of you if you'll take the time to saturate yourself. Well, I don't have enough time for God. You ever hear that one? Well, if I could make some room for God to get him in. Here, come on now. All right, point two. All right. Point two, walking in God's wisdom. James chapter three, please. Folks, the Bible says in Proverbs 133, you'll go to James three. Proverbs 133 says, whoever listens to me will dwell safely 
and be quiet from any fear of evil. And if you read chapter 1 of Proverbs, Proverbs says, if you don't listen to me, all hell's going to break loose. But if you do listen to me, you're going to dwell safely. Now, which is the better choice? Dwell safely. So every time you get in trouble, who didn't you listen to? Sounds like your childhood, didn't it? Your, your father is so much more of a father than we give him credit. He is so into you. It's like you're the only one that exists. And he can do that with every one of us. So allow him to father you. Because there's plenty of Christians that don't have a Christian father. What I mean is not a human father. They won't let God father them. So they're, they're illegitimate and can't follow God. They have enough, they're not father. You're out there on your own. No, surrender to God and let God father you. Amen, nothing like it, is there, Linda? Oh, it's wonderful. Makes you tear up and suddenly you're, you're going, man, this is great, Lord. He's exercising your spirituality. Amen. All right. Listen, okay, walking in the wisdom, James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Look at your neighbor and say, you are. Okay, because you have the wise one in you, don't you? Now, you can operate on your own or the wise one. Which one's going to be in control? Today is a di different day. So it says, let him show by good conduct his mannerisms. That his works are done in meekness, being gentle of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against the truth. I'm cool. I'm doing good. And yet your life's falling apart. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, ruled by the senses, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. See, God doesn't love that atmosphere and that's not where God dwells in that kind of confusion. But the wisdom of God is from above is first what? Pure. Every motive, everything God does is pure. Then it is what? Besides being pure, it's peaceable. You see, when God's operating, he brings you to rest and peace so he can talk with you. People that are agitated can't hear anything. Ladies, don't talk to your husband when he's focused on something. Okay? Isn't it amazing your nose itches when you've got goo on your hands? Talk to your husband when he's focused on something. He won't hear a thing you're saying. Wait till he's done and then share. Otherwise, you'll say, remember what I said the other day? I haven't got a clue, dear. Yeah. Amen. See, we're more focused on items than ladies have, can go two or three things, have children, and zip, 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 zip. You know, don't you understand what I'm feeling? Zip, 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 zip. And the guy's going, oh, I'm just trying to get this bowl in. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm trying to get the bowl in. I'll get to that later. And guys... Girls don't want you to give them the answer. They just want you to listen to the problem. You're not Mr. Fix-It, even though you are. So if somebody in your life is, wants to tell you where they're feeling stuff, don't try to jump in with Mr. Fix-It. It's not a good thing to do. Did you hear the amen from my beautiful wife? Back? Amen. So we need to walk in God's wisdom. God's wisdom will keep us out of trouble. Take the time to slow down and let God calculate your steps. You're in a business, let him calculate who you do business with and some of the ploys in the business. Praying over everything. Isn't it amazing? It tells us in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known. He didn't say just a few things. All things. Why? Because you have an enemy out there who doesn't like you smiling. Doesn't like you running around telling people about God. Doesn't like you prospering, being in health. Doesn't like you being healed. Any of those things. 
So he lays trips on your mind. You should count it a privilege that the devil tries to lie to you. Because you are that dangerous to him. See, if I don't hear any of flack coming from the devil in a week or two, I know he's got me somewhere. I go back over the plan and see where he's at. And you know who knows where the devil's at all the time? Is God. So why don't we go with God and let him figure that out? And us, we just rest. Amen? And so when I fight, I don't fight in my own strength or in my own natural man. I release God. When I pray, I don't pray in my own natural thinking. I release God out of my chest and say, in the name of Jesus, and I slow it down. If you watch some really good preachers, really anointed men and women of God, they slow down their, their talking and they're more purposeful. They're bringing God out into the words that they're saying. Hello, Jesus was that way. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I, you know I love you. He said, Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Uh, well, Lord, I'm your friend, yes. He says, then feed my lambs. Peter. Now Peter's going, oh man, this is God. Do you really love me, Peter? Don't just fill me full of bowl. Love me, feed my sheep. You see, most people, we're, we're living here with God. When you hear them pray, they're just spouting off words. and Very seldom from here. Don't pray that way. God is not amused with our head. He wants to hear our heart cry. He wants to hear us say, Lord, I want you to go into my heart and fix me. Go in there and make those changes. Amen. Thank you, all you individuals. Pitch yourself and say, yes, it's a good day. All right. So we need to walk in wisdom. Can you say amen? The scripture tells us over there in Corinthians, is walk in wisdom, wisdom to those who are without God, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Amen. In other words, buy back the time you wasted when you were a part of your, buy back the time that possibly you didn't know what to do. Now you can do it. You can share what God's been doing in your life. You don't have to preach the word, Adam. Just share what Jesus is doing in your life. Watch what happens. Whenever we lift him up, good things happen. All right, let's move on. Listen to this. Wisdom of God now dwells in you and I. In our spirit man, the new creation, the new creature is full of God's wisdom. Tap the source. Proverbs says, it says, wisdom in the heart of man is like deep waters. But a woman or a man of understanding will learn to draw it out. Draw it out. How do you draw water out of a well? You lower the bucket down, you get the water in there. Hello, or you got a pump handle. Listen, one thing God requires is your faith in action, and he'll do the rest. So walking in wisdom, Proverbs chapter 2, 6 through 8 says, For the Lord gives wisdom... And from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. That's you and I. And he's a shield for those that walk uprightly. When you choose to follow God, God shields you. There's another testimony, the Old Testament. Now, aren't we in Christ? So who does the devil see when we're in Christ? Who's the devil see? He sees Christ. He doesn't see you. It's when we open our mouth and give ourselves away. I hope it's working, God. Okay, so when you meet with God, you, you're put daily. God clothes you daily with the robes of his son's righteousness. Then he puts on you the armor. You don't put the armor on you. You don't go helmet of salvation and breastplate of righteousness, uh, feet shot. By that time, you're going to have a dozen arrows shot through you. It's the Father who puts the armor on you. Well, it says put the armor on you. Yes, but to put your armor on you, if I wanted to be fitted for a wedding and I wanted a suit put on me, I'll go to the suit place and get fitted. So the way we put armor on is we go to God and say, Lord, clothe me with your armor, your light. See, it's also called the armor of light. 
Clothe me with all that. You have to ask it in Jesus' name. He clothes you with it. Then remember when you get up, Satan didn't hear any of your prayers. He can't go with you in your prayer closet because you prayed in the name of Jesus. You see, in the Old Testament, they couldn't pray in the name of Jesus. They talked to God hoping that he's going to hear. Man, you got to study. So in the New Testament, Jesus says, look, we got a hotline. And the day that I go home to be with God and I'm resurrected, don't bother talking to me. Talk to the Father using my name. When the Father sees the name is on it, you got it. Yeah, baby, you got it. Amen. You do. Father, in Jesus' name. Now, the Bible says all the promises of God are what? Yes, in him and amen in him. So when you're praying the promises of God, is God going to say no? I had this brother, he said, yes, God answers all of our, all of our prayers, and sometimes he says no. I says, only to those that are praying kind of completely loopy. Are you from Olympia? <laughs> I don't hope I don't get a letter from somebody in Olympia. <laughs> Okay, so we walk in God's wisdom. We get that wisdom. We have it inside of us, but to spark it for the day we have to meet with God. Third thing, having a spiritual mindset. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. How many here believe in the Bible literally? As much as we can, literally. So if God says we're in Christ, where are we? What does that mean to you? Well, I'm a part of Christ. No. If I'm in my car, where am I? Get it. Let's get it because this is what Satan's holding from us. Now we have to get it here, not here. I'm, so if I'm in my car, then I'm in my car. I'm not in here. If I'm in here, then I'm not in my car. If I'm in Christ, then where am I? Uh-huh. And I want you to know you're totally in Christ. So Satan can't see you. As soon as you get, learn what I'm going to tell you, if you haven't learned it already, Satan can't see you until you open your mouth or do something foolish. Then you flag him. Everyone say, I'm not going to flag down the devil. But we do. You don't know what's going on. We flag him. Listen, you're out of touch. As long as you got up to your prayer and you're walking with God, which we are supposed to, walk in the spirit, then we are literally untouchable. Don't get mad at me. It's only until we start taking over again and running things now, I realize you have a job and you have certain things you have to go through in routine, but bring God into those routines and cover all of that. You get the best tips. You get the best job. The next opening, you're going to get the raise. But we don't choose to walk with Christ. We choose to be good. And that's great. But you can't be good all the time. But in Christ, you can so going back to that, Satan does not see you. He sees Christ. He's a scared to death of Christ. So he'll back off of you and wait until you show up. Now, folks, again, some of you know this, some of you don't. Your armor doesn't fall off. I was taught that in Bible college, that the armor is only on the front. It's not on the back. So don't turn your back to the enemy. How many here remember hearing that crazy teaching? You mean to tell me my God's retarded? He wouldn't, he wouldn't cover my back? Think about this stuff. This is how Satan gets in, in this religious teaching. No, he comes over you like a dome. The word is shield of faith. It's a dome of faith with an opening to heaven. So you are in actually a tube that looks like Jesus that has access to heaven, an umbilical adjointing into your spirit, and Satan can't see as long as you're in that tube. But we get out of that too because we have a free will and we often take it to our own purpose and we end up sticking our left foot in our, in our mouth and doing crazy things. I, I wrote a lady one time, this lady I love with all my heart. I helped her raise up, helped her get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and everything like that. But she loves to talk about things and problems and everything. Pretty soon she gets in the car wreck all these things start going wrong. Kids start rebelling and everything like that. She's going, and she's on 
Facebook. Well, I understand why God's allowing this. So I wrote her. I said, God's not allowing any of it. It's your gossip, and you're speaking against other people. That's done. I haven't heard anything from her. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I was really wondering why did, she didn't shake my hand. Say, thank you very much for that. But you know what? She later on told me that she put it in check, and things turned around. So sometimes we can get on the glide when we're Christians and sort of just slide around and enjoy, enjoy the desserts. But what God wants us to do is learn how to wear the armor and learn how to walk with God so that we can enjoy our life. Wow. How would you like tomorrow to be guaranteed to be better than today? Go talk to God. All right, moving on to my next one. Walk in wisdom, right? Having a spiritual mindset. Colossians 3, you didn't forget, right? Look at that. Look, at how many here born again? So the Bible says if you're born again, then you're risen with Christ spiritually too. You're here on the earth, but you're also in heaven. That's what we call the mystery of godliness. So you're sitting in Christ in heavenly places. Say amen. amen. You're risen with Christ in heavenly places. So there's a part of you that's risen, that's glorified, and there's a part of you that's a mud spudge. It's called your flesh. So don't walk for God in your physical man. Walk with God by your spirit. Not for God, with God. There's a difference. Oh, Lord, had I not done this in your name? Haven't I done this in your name? Didn't I do this in your name? And God says, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. You did it all for a name and position. You didn't do it for me. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Thank God that's not going to fit you because you're all full of God. Say amen. <laughs> you see how oftentimes we're so insecure, we want to feel guilt even though we don't have any. Don't lie. Don't, don't look that way at me. I'm, I'm not trying to tell you a lie or anything. Okay. Having a spiritual mind. So if you're risen with Christ, seek, crave after, worship after those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Someone say amen. amen. Now it says set your mind. It's a mindset. You have to make yourself think better things. Set your mind on things above not on things of this earth. So if you're thinking of yourself, where's your mind? In heaven or on earth? If you're thinking about the problems of life, where's your mind? Heaven or earth? Amen. Have you learned anything by looking at people's problems? Sure did. Not to do that. <laughs> you see, the idea of the enemy is to get you to focus on this lower earthly plane. I hate to use the word plane. It's on new agey. On this earthly life. That's where he dwells. Not to think in God's realm or to think heavenly. He even got a statement he uses. Oh, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. If you think about that, that's a complete lie. You need to be so heavenly minded you can help somebody. Amen. Amen. So heavenly minded, you're so anointed, you can pray and lay hands on them and get healed. That's your God. He lives in you. Learn to release him, not yourself. Don't charm people with your personality. You might have a bad day tomorrow and all that will be erased. You ever notice when you drive those beautiful picket fences? You know, those wonderful ranches and stuff with all the horses and everything. And then you notice one picket fence is broken on the top. Of all that entire beautiful picket fence, what's the one that stands out most of all? That's right. So try not to stand out, broken one. Try to hide yourself in Christ every day and let God clothe you and saturate you and make you beautiful. Say amen, somebody. So we need to have a heavenly mindset. We need to realize that we walk with God. And that even if we blow it, God doesn't leave us, doesn't forsake us. He's still right there waiting for us to go, okay, I see that. Thank you, Lord, and just keep on walking. He said we're going to the other side, didn't he? In the Old Testament, Jesus was on the mountain praying, and the storms came, and he had to walk on water and quiet the storm. Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus was in their boat, 
Storms still came. But they woke Jesus up and said, we perished, Jesus. Jesus says, where's your faith? He rebuked the winds and the thing. Jesus is no longer up on the hill praying for you. He lives in your heart. He's in your boat. He's going to carry you to heaven if you will just get your hands off of trying to operate everything. Someone say amen. <laughs> you going tonight? I'm serious. It's us taking our control. You have a steering wheel in your car, right? You just don't throw your hands up and let it steer. No, you guide it, right? And it gives you control of that vehicle. That's what pastors are for. That's what God's for, to guide our life. So our life takes on a beauty and a love that we originally were supposed to have that Adam saw fit that we didn't. So God came to restore us, rescue us, and then he's going to remake the earth and put us back here and say reign and rule just like the beginning. Wow. Moving right along. So you're walking in wisdom, having a godly mindset. Amen. So a couple of points I want to bring up. Thinking the old way that we used to think. Avoid it. Folks, some people think this way. Other people tell white lies. It's okay for me to tell a white lie. I'm not referring to that. We assume other people do it, so we do it too. I want to let you know, there's certain things that you might think that I do that I don't do. Stop justifying what you do, whether people do it or not. You need to go to God and find what he wants you to do, how he wants you to live. Some of you... He's got a higher, greater situation. Some of you are doing just great. But when, without going to God, he can't unveil our future. Hello? Amen. So literally, Romans 8, verses 1 through 8 says, Therefore, this is to all of us, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Are we born again? Are we in Christ Jesus? So where's that condemnation coming from? Others and the devil. And sometimes we condemn ourselves. Now, how many here can quote me John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish or come to an untimely death, but have everlasting life. How many here can quote 17? For God did not send his son, that's good, into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Now, look at that. There are people out there in the name of Christ condemning other people. And God did not send a son to do that. So what are they doing? Yeah. And who's the condemner? Have you ever listened to some people when they talk? They're accusatory. You did this. You've always done that. Never have that in your vocabulary. Get that out of there. That's poison. Nobody always does and doing this and doing that. It's a judgment you're not supposed to have. Hello? I've done preach myself. Happy. Good stuff, folks. Just, just so that we understand how to position ourselves. Okay? Okay, look what it says. And it says, there's no condemnation for us who walk with Jesus Christ, who do not walk according to our flesh, but according to the Spirit of God. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law and sin and death. Let me explain that to you. The law and sin and death was shown us by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was given to the Israelites to show them they cannot save themselves. Somebody said, well, what is the commandments for? They were to show the humanity that we can't become our own Messiah. We can't save ourselves. So for a Gentile like you and I are, we're not Jewish, then it's a, a reminder that we need Jesus and not try to follow rules and regulations. Say amen. Okay, but for the Jews, they followed it. Not only that, they added to it. And when Jesus showed up, they didn't even recognize him. Religion will blind you. Don't be religious. Walk with God. Say amen. All right. So it says, for those that live according to the flesh will set their minds on the things of the flesh. And those that live according to the spirit will set their minds on the things of the spirit. 
For to be carnally minded, everyone say carnally minded. This is one of my oldest little jokes. The word carnal means meat. To be carnally minded means you're a meathead. You can borrow that from me. That's when, when you're being a meathead, you're not going to do anything wrong. Carnal thinking is selfish thinking. That's all it is. It's very selfish. It, it's kind of like you had to have the last piece of pie, you know, and you had to get in front of the line. These, these are just silly things. You guys have outgrown all of that. You meathead. <laughs> be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. We're spiritually united because we think with the wisdom of God. Can you say amen? And everyone turn with me to Matthew 25. We're finishing. Oh, thank God I went over, didn't I? But Matthew 25 talks about the talents. And I'll just talk it to you. Remember to one, it was a, an owner that went away. And he, as he left, he gave to one of his servants five talents. And to one of his servants, two talents. And to his other servant, one talent. Now, and he says this, each one to their own ability. God is not going to give you to live, have you live to something that you're not designed to do. You follow what I'm saying? So it, God will give to you according to your ability. Okay? You're not going to change your ability. He's designed and it's already set in you. So you might be one that just gets one. You might be one that gets two. You might be one that gets five. You might be one that has ten. It doesn't matter. God's no respecter of persons. You're not better or lesser than anyone else. It's what we do with what God gives us. So we knew he, he finally comes back and he visits the one with the five talents. And he says, look, I took your, your money and I went out and got another five. And he says, well done. You know the story. And the two went out and got another two. And then the one... Very important that you know this. The one says, I have your money. But he never invested it. He hid it in the earth. He didn't give it to the bank so they could have interest. He simply buried the money. This is a story about Christ and his gifts in your heart. To one, you're very charismatic. You're very gifted. And so... You, you probably have this position within the body. You see, some of us are feet, some of us are hands, some of us are ears or eyes. It's as God purposed to put them in the body that way. So you might have five talents. What are you going to do with them? You're going to go use the things that God has given you to win others? Every vehicle I've ever owned as a Christian all been used for the kingdom of God. I still pick up people in my Lexus. Okay. How did you get that Lexus? I bought it really used and it's really old. But it was well taken care of. Had very little miles and the payment is very affordable. It's 2005, so now you know I can afford it. I pick up everything I have is really God's and I want to use it in God's. I want to keep it in God's positional of use. Say amen. Because Satan's accuser, he'll say, ah, you're hoarding that for yourself. You know the accuser. Don't listen to him. So God gave each one of us these gifts. But if we're like that last man, well, he just got one. It doesn't matter. He should have done what everybody else did. He went and he hid his Lord's money and he buried it within his life. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Do you talk about him openly? I hope so. That's what's wrong with the world. People stop talking about Jesus. Well, I don't want to get fired. You can do it better than that. You're running on fear. You can share. You can meet for coffee afterward. Come on now. Stop limiting God. You are here on this planet to win souls and touch other people's lives. Not to get what you can get on this planet. God's already seen fit to bless you, hasn't he? So, what are we doing with the blessings we got? We have to be led by the Spirit, but we cannot bury them. Can you say amen? thinking that when God take, picks us up, we can give Jesus back. No, we're to give them away. Can you say amen? We're to share them. What if they say no? What if they scream at us? Just let them scream. You know what? I had a guy. Can I share? I got two minutes to share this with you. We used to take a group of people out. I loved to go out on the street and witness. And we were done witnessing down at Pacific Avenue back in the days when it was 
pretty filthy down there. And on the way back, we stopped at a frat party. And the guy says, look at some of my guys at Bible college. You know, I forget what the name of the college, not Bible college, but uh, Pierce County College, one of the colleges in Tacoma. They're having a big kegger party. Let's go share Jesus with them. So we went over there and shared Jesus. And you know what? We said to the guy, there was a bouncer at the front, and he says, it's three bucks to get in, all the beer you can drink. And says, hey, we're Christians. We don't want to come in to drink. We want to come in to share. And he looked at us, and I don't know why he did this. It was God. And he looked up, and then he looked at God, you know, and looked back at us. He says, go in free. So what I do, I went down by the keg and stood with tracks. Would you like to know about the Lord? I mean, somebody could have decked me. I mean, it could have been anything. Then I hear this screaming and yelling from the top of the stairs. I'm down in the basement by the, they had the keg sitting on the wash machine. And I'm down there below and I hear this guy scream, get those blank and blank Christians out of there. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, you just, blah, 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 blah. and you hear somebody say, we want those Christians here. You go. And they took them and they threw them out on the lawn. So sometimes being noisy and complaining can get you thrown out on the lawn. The very next day, we went to Life Center to watch the singing Christmas tree. How many's ever been there? Amen. And they had an altar call afterwards. And guess who I saw go to the altar? Mr. Screamer that got thrown out on the lawn. Sometimes when people react to you violently, it's because they're convicted. And what you're telling them is the truth. So don't go by what you see their reaction. Always go for the juggler, the heart. I never talk to somebody's head. I only talk a moment to your head, but then I'll start talking to your heart. I'm a kind of a crazy friend to have. Hello. Carrie, how come every time I'm hanging around you, I get convicted of my sins? No. So, folks, did you get something out of that? You see the importance how God wants to bypass all this crust. Remember the enemy. Now, I'm not trying to do it. The enemy has got into the church, folks. He's got into some churches. And he's silenced a lot of them. And I don't know how he's done that or why, but he's not going to get in here. Can you say amen? And I hope you get so filled with God and so full of the truth that you'll be able to help your your friends, your relatives, and sharing that with them. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. All right, if you got some of that, we give the Lord a praise. Thank you.